Hey everyone dear friends, this is Drake on the Crime Story Diaries channel. Today we'll be examining a disturbing case so I invite you to watch the video. Don't forget to leave your comments and likes. Chapter 1. Harold Sasko Harold Sasko, better known as Hal, lived in Kansas City. He was born on September 11, 1961, in Tidotsville, Florida, and was one of 12 children in the family. His siblings described Harold as a person who was ready to take responsibility in almost any situation. He often helped his brothers and sisters with household chores and was generally very organized. So it was not surprising that after graduating from college, Hal opened his own pizzeria. And just two years later, he expanded his business by starting a second restaurant. This led to his move to Lawrence in late 1990 with his then-wife Anna and their three-year-old daughter Mendez. There, not far away in the city of Topeka, Hal opened a third restaurant. Harold became dependent on his business and his hard work and lifestyle focused solely on work did not suit his wife. After all, Hal was not only a business owner, but also a husband and father, so his wife and child deserved his attention. Eventually, this led to a serious rift between the couple. And when his wife could no longer endure the lonely life, they decided to divorce. Hal was considered a church parishioner, and he was proud of being not only a man of God, but also a respected member of the community. Those around him knew him as a kind, caring, and extremely organized manager. So it came as a real shock to the community when on January 17, 2014, their so-called good and caring manager suddenly disappeared. Chapter 2 Harold's Disappearance The day began like any other Friday. The weekend was just around the corner, and many people went to work to carry out their daily duties. Of course, this day was no exception for the pizzeria employees. The problem was that when they arrived at work, they found themselves in a quiet and empty restaurant. Usually, Hal was there to unlock the kitchen, but this time, he was nowhere to be seen. Even stranger was the fact that it had been several days since anyone had heard from him. Concerned about his well-being, the employees called the police and demanded a welfare check at his home on West 26th Street. Later that day, a police officer was sent to his residence. When he knocked on the front door, he was met with silence. When he knocked on the front window of the house, he also received no response. The officer then looked inside to see if anyone was home and it was at that moment that he saw the figure of a man lying face down on the floor. Calling for backup, law enforcement officials burst into the house. It was confirmed that the man on the floor was Hal, and moreover, he was lying in a pool of his own blood. It immediately became apparent that he was already dead, and judging by the condition of his body, he had been dead for several days. Moreover, it was not an accident. His hands were tied behind his back with zip ties, which were used to keep him under control. Hal's legs were also tied, but the most horrifying detail was that his throat was cut so deeply that the bone inside was shattered. With such a serious and brutal wound, he had no chance of survival. The officers were faced with an extremely gruesome scene. To top it all off, the police found several empty bottles at the other end of the room, as well as a phone and laptop that did not belong to Hal. They also noticed the absence of Hal's car in the driveway. But the strangest piece of evidence left at the crime scene was the word freedom sloppily written on the wall in Hal's blood. Chapter 3. The Investigation the sudden influx of officers in the area undoubtedly drew increased attention from curious neighbors. The police decided to use this to their advantage and began asking more questions. That's how they learned that Harold was not living alone. His neighbors claimed that he was living with a girl he called his stepdaughter. This information turned out to be very important for the officers. Now they knew that there was a person who not only knew Harold well and was in constant contact with him, but was also present at the crime scene. Eventually, it was established that the so-called stepdaughter was 18-year-old Sarah Gonzalez McLean, who had been living with him for the last two years of his life. However, a problem arose. Sarah was nowhere to be found. This, of course, greatly concerned the officers. Finding Sarah became a top priority for law enforcement, 
as they had no idea what exactly had happened to her. She could have been abducted, become a victim, a witness, a suspect, or perhaps none of the above. In any case, it was now absolutely necessary to find her. Family members and friends were informed about this horrific crime, and three weeks later, on February 8th, a funeral was planned in memory of the lost community member. The public was urged to contact Douglas County forensic investigators and provide any information about Sarah's whereabouts. A reward of $1,000 was announced for any useful information. Chapter 4. Sarah's Background Sarah Gonzalez McLean was born on July 9, 1994, in Topeka, Kansas. She grew up in a loving family of five. She had a brother and a sister. Throughout her childhood, Sarah was known as a shy but kind child. Since she was homeschooled for many years, she had few friends outside her neighborhood. However, this does not mean that she had a bad upbringing. Her parents were wonderful people, and she was always close to her sister. Unfortunately, when Sarah was a teenager, her parents eventually decided to divorce, which significantly affected her at such a vulnerable age. After her parents' divorce, her childhood and adolescence unfortunately only worsened. Sarah was quite naive, having been sheltered from the outside world by her parents. And unfortunately, people who are ready to take advantage of such a situation are always around. After her parents' divorce, Sarah experienced inappropriate behavior from a neighbor, and unfortunately, he eventually abused her. This event greatly influenced Sarah's character and behavior. She began to act completely differently than before. Much to her mother's dismay, Sarah began sneaking out of the house at night and hanging out with the wrong crowd. Even worse, this led to her frequent use of illicit substances and alcohol to drown out her suffering. It seemed that after her parents' divorce, Sarah no longer wanted to stay in her family home. As a result, at the age of 14, she found a job in an attempt to start an independent life. That's when the pizzeria hired her. At the time of meeting Harold, he was 50 years old, almost four times Sarah's age. At first, he seemed like an ordinary kind manager, but there were rumors among the staff that he was not quite what he appeared to be. For example, Hal told all the restaurant managers that they could only hire young, attractive women. Chapter 5. Sarah's Work at the Pizzeria While working at the pizzeria, Sarah would wake up, go to work, spend time there, and eventually return home to her family. She often spent nights drinking before returning home. According to some reports, she was only sober at work, if you could call it that. Despite the fact that she often came in drunk and nearly got fired several times over those few months, she somehow managed to keep her job. That's because Hal seemed to feel sorry for her. He knew that she was vulnerable and needed extra support. When Sarah turned 15, she tragically experienced another traumatic event. One such evening, another man attacked her, and to top it all off, this scumbag even burned her with cigarettes. After that, Sarah's already fragile mental health completely crumbled. She stopped going to work, lost friends, and sank into a very dark state. And then, less than a year later, at the age of 16, she attempted to take her own life. Fortunately, Sarah's family found her in time to call an ambulance. She fully recovered, but it was only after the girl spent five months in the hospital. The nicest thing was that after being discharged from the hospital, Sarah received support from loved ones and friends. But one of these messages of support stood out in particular. It was from her former boss, Hal. After her tragic ordeal, Hal offered to become her personal life coach or even a kind of guardian. He could pick her up, take her somewhere to eat, and even let her express everything that was on her mind. Since there was no one else to turn to, Sarah eventually enlisted his support. It was during one of these walks that she told him her entire story, including her tragic encounters with other men, drinking, and everything else. Now Hal knew that she wanted to leave her family home, and upon learning about the traumas she had experienced, he suggested that she live with him in his own house. It all seemed a bit dubious. The problem was that Sarah was vulnerable, lost, and hurt. Hal's offer gave her a way out of it all, so at the age of 17, she agreed. Chapter 6. Sarah's Life with Hal After moving in with Hal, everything seemed to stabilize for a short time. She found a new job far away from the pizzeria. Hal took great care of her, her dog moved in with her, and she even considered college. 
But Sarah's mother was unhappy with the whole situation. She found Hal quite strange, and the whole story seemed very suspicious to her. Every time she tried to talk to Sarah about it, it always ended in a big fight, which of course further alienated her daughter. Michelle didn't believe that Hal's intentions were always as innocent as he made them out to be. Even worse, she believed that her daughter was most likely too naive and prone to illusions to realize it. After the divorce, Sarah's father broke off all contact, and now she was trying to fill the void that had formed. To make the situation even more eerie, Hal eventually asked Sarah to call him dad, and then he told all the neighbors that she was his stepdaughter. It's not surprising that Sarah's colleagues eventually found out about all this and inquired about her relationship with Hal. Now, when asked about it, Sarah insisted that he was just her friend and nothing more. But from an outsider's perspective, it was strange that a 50-year-old man brought an attractive but troubled 18-year-old girl into his home, and perhaps her peers suspected something. As soon as Sarah settled into the house and began to feel more comfortable, Hal started setting his own boundaries and attitudes towards life, especially when she turned 18. This change was quite alarming. Hal began buying her illegal drugs and alcohol, joking about them dating, and even brought up the topic of a sexual relationship with Sarah. In addition to these changes, he openly kept track of everything he bought for her, including alcohol, illegal drugs, cosmetics, and rent. He wanted her to feel indebted to him, and he also told her that she would only be able to leave once she paid him back. In fact, she felt so trapped that after she turned 18, she gave in to his advances, and her relationship with the man she once called Dad now became sexual. This diabolical situation lasted for a whole 10 months, and according to Sarah, they had sex several times a week. The only way she could cope was to drink and use illegal substances until she no longer felt involved in the situation. This, of course, further increased her debt to the man who was now using her body. On top of everything, Hal berated Sarah just as often as he complimented her. For example, he criticized her nose and then offered to pay for plastic surgery, which she, unsure of herself, eventually agreed to. It was clear that Hal treated her as his personal property, rather than as another human being with feelings. He also paid for her gum implantation, and his next goal was to buy her breast implants. Both of these surgeries cost $16,000, which of course was added to the bill, and she had to pay him back when she could afford it. She found herself trapped with no way out. In addition to this, Hal also threatened Sarah, telling her that he had connections if she ever tried to escape. From that moment on, her mental health deteriorated even further. In response, she was given antidepressants to cope with the situation, for which she would eventually have to pay again. Chapter 7. Sarah Kills Hal Trapped by the mental trauma of abuse and depression, Sarah's mind became clouded. She repeatedly found herself on the brink, and now, after supposedly finding someone she could rely on, he too turned out to be an abuser. Sarah had absolutely had enough, and she began to act in a way that eventually turned the victim into a killer. After visiting a pet store, she bought a rabbit and signed a waiver before taking it home. That same evening, one of Hal's pizzeria managers was visiting the house for dinner and drinks. The manager was shocked when he opened the refrigerator and saw a rabbit carcass instead of beer. Sarah not only admitted that she was responsible for killing the pet rabbit, but also stated that it was not the first animal she had killed. Completely bewildered by the situation, the manager politely stayed for dinner, but then went home. This was a huge red flag and an indication of what Sarah was potentially capable of. Unfortunately, this sign was ignored. The main question remained whether Sarah was truly capable of killing a person. Although Sarah was initially considered missing, it was soon established that she was actually the prime suspect. Unfortunately, the detectives were not mistaken in their assumptions. They suspected that she had packed all her belongings, taken the dog, stolen Harold's car, and fled to Texas. However, along the way, she changed her plans and headed to Florida. It was warmer there, and the idea of admiring the ocean view seemed pleasant. Given this newly received information, she was officially declared a wanted person. Sarah was not only wanted on suspicion of murdering Hal, 
but also as mentally unwell and possibly dangerous to others. Her name was on the lips of many officers across the country, and this continued for 11 days. On January 25, 2014, after being on the run for just over a week and a half, Sarah McLean was finally found and arrested in Everglades National Park. Not surprisingly, the police officer found her in Hal's stolen car, sleeping next to a loaded gun. They also found $2,400 in cash, two more guns, an ax, and a couple of knives, one of which was stained with Harold's blood. Chapter 8 Sarah's Trial A few hours after her arrest, a three-hour interrogation began, during which Sarah confessed to killing the man. According to her version of events, the story unfolded as follows. On January 14, 2014, Harold returned home after a long day at work. The sound system had recently broken down, and he decided to devote the evening to repairing it. He asked Sarah to bring him a beer, and then another, and another. After a few hours, fatigue took its toll and Hal suddenly passed out on the floor. He didn't even suspect that Sarah had actually put a large amount of sleeping pills in one of his last bottles. By that point, she had already decided Hal had to die. She tied him up with zip ties, took a hunting knife, and then a few minutes later, slit his throat. Shortly after that, Harold died in his sleep. Sarah then took a shower, listening to her favorite music, and washed all the blood off herself. After that, she called work to say that she would be out for a few days because, unfortunately, a relative had passed away. She then packed her things, including a photo of her sister, took the dog, and disappeared into the night in Hal's stolen car. To avoid being found, she left her cell phone and laptop at home. During the interrogation, Sarah openly shared her motives. She was locked in the house and in debt to a man who clearly wanted to possess her. She became his target, was abused, and then turned into his property. Anger clouded her thirst for revenge, and regardless of the consequences, revenge was exactly what she wanted. Sarah also expressed a strong desire to resort to violence. She admitted to killing rabbits out of curiosity. She also claimed that for two years, she had thoughts of violence and noticed that they were progressing. Obviously, Sarah's confession put her in a very difficult position. She not only confessed to killing Hal, but also to enjoying violence. Given these horrific facts, it became absolutely clear that she would face trial. However, it was also clear that Sarah was undoubtedly mentally unwell. So first and foremost, she would have to undergo a psychological examination. In addition to her recently developed penchant for violence, she also claimed to have memory lapses and felt that she was an observer in her own mind. Not surprisingly, Sarah was eventually diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder. In Sarah's mind, she was not just Sarah. She was also Vanessa, Alice, Mila, and the Nameless One. Alice was the weepy and vulnerable side of Sarah, while Vanessa was the strong militant fighter inside her. Mila was feminine, polite, and liked to please people. But of course, the saddest version of them was the Nameless One, who took on all the consequences of the trauma and depression. Chapter 9. Sarah's Sentence When it came to Sarah's trial, her dissociative identity disorder was the main line of defense. She claimed that a girl named Alice wanted to take her own life, but the other personalities convinced her not to. After careful discussion among themselves, they decided that the only way out was to kill Harold. In a clearer and healthier world, Sarah's defense team argued that she was in a state of clinical dissociation when she committed her crime. The abuse Sarah endured living with Harold is alarming. However, it was ultimately deemed irrelevant as everything was consensual. From an investigative point of view, this was not compelling evidence. The defense itself also could not be persuasive as the murder was clearly intentional. Unfortunately for Sarah, Although her mental disorder was recognized as genuine, her defense failed to convince the judges, and she was ultimately found guilty of murdering Harold Sasko. She was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 50 years. This greatly shocked both Sarah and her family. It became apparent that the abuse she had endured throughout her life and her mental state at the time of the murder were not taken into account when sentencing her. 
which means that her punishment was much harsher than she deserved. Sarah filed an appeal on the grounds that the abuse she suffered should have been considered during the trial. And fortunately, by that time, more evidence of Hal's horrible behavior had been uncovered. After analyzing his computers, detectives found that they were literally riddled with illegal pornography. In addition, another woman, whose name remains unknown, claimed that Hal had hit on both of her daughters. Given all this new evidence, Sarah's appeal resulted in a 50% reduction in her sentence to 25 years. To this day, she still remains behind bars, and that's because although the judge concluded that Hal did indeed abuse his control over Sarah, it doesn't negate the fact that she still committed premeditated murder. Chapter 10, Conclusions. Sarah was initially a victim. Harold was a cruel manipulator of young women and did a very good job of deceiving many people in his community. However, some still remember him as an extremely generous person. Harold also had good sides. For example, he was known to have helped many employees get out of financial crisis, and whenever someone needed advice, he was always ready to help. Harold's family does not deny his shameful actions, but they testify to his positive character. He clearly needed help and did wrong, but he never deserved to die. Although Sarah's family agrees that she must be punished for her crimes, they also believe that the sentence was too harsh for someone trying to escape her abuser. Harold was undoubtedly a favorite of many people, but at the same time, he was a wolf in sheep's clothing. This story is an example of how life circumstances, trauma, and a lack of proper support can lead to tragic consequences. Sarah became a victim of abuse by someone she trusted, and it caused irreparable damage to her mental health. However, this does not justify her actions, the deliberate murder of another human being. This story also demonstrates how important it is to be attentive to those around us and to be able to recognize warning signs. Perhaps if someone had intervened earlier, the tragedy could have been avoided. At the same time, this story raises questions about the fairness of the justice system. Was Sarah's punishment adequate, given all the circumstances? Was her mental state and the trauma she suffered sufficiently taken into account? These questions remain open for discussion. Ultimately, this story serves as a reminder that a completely different personality can be hiding behind a person's appearance. Harold, whom many considered kind and generous, actually turned out to be a manipulator and a predator. This story prompts us to be careful in our judgments of others and to always remember that the truth can be much more complex than it appears at first glance.